Okay, so now we're going to take a quick look at uh, control flow in R just to give you enough uh, really about how to use if else sorts of statements and there's actually as you'll see an if else function that's a vectorized function and also how to use for loops. Uh, I, I have a brief example in here with while loops but mostly for the class we'll use for loops when, when we do any iterations uh, in this sort of way. And again I, I remind you that probably the best thing for you to do is have R open yourself and be running through this and playing with it while you're doing it. Pause mine, uh, my, uh, my talking and, and play with it. It's very important. Okay, uh, so the file is the introduction to control introduction control floor flow r dot r, um, which should be up on the website. And we're going to start start with really what the standard sort of if else, the same way you would have learned it in Python or C or or whatever language. And here we're going to implement it with respect to a little function we've written. Uh, and I've just noticed this function is not written according to the style guide, so I apologize right now, but this is the function that we're going to use, this p.test. Um, and uh, basically what we're saying here, so the first line again, we call a function by just going function. In the, in the uh, parentheses p, that means the only input argument uh, is going to be whatever p is. We're going to can put it at any, anything we want in here, as you can see it's designed for vectors. And then the curly braces uh, really sort of define what's in this function. Uh, and so what do we say? Well, if, here's this first line, if uh, p is less than or equal to 0 0.05, print yay. Um, and then, so not surprisingly, if we have an input that is less than 0 0.05, we expect to see yay. Else, if p is greater than or equal to 0 0.9, print high. Um, so we now have uh, what we'll do uh, if the, whatever the, the value is, the, in this case either scalar or vector, if the value is less than 0 0.05 or greater than 0 0.9, we, we'll see what happens. But what happens if it's anywhere between? Well, that's the final else. else. If it's anything else, uh, so really anywhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.9, print somewhere in the middle. So let's just run that function. Um, and we're going to write a somewhat similar function, but using uh, an, an R-specific function called ifElse. And you'll notice it's actually written as a single word, if else. It's not like above where it's if or and then else if as separate words. This is actually calling a very specific function, which, as you'll see below in a moment, actually has very different consequences uh, of, of how it's used. And you'll largely, in this class, use this if else statement. So we're specifically saying if else uh, p is less than or equal to 0.05, you'll print the word yippee. And if it's greater than, uh, if it's anything else, you'll print bummer man. Okay. All right. So we're going to generate a vector, which is using uh, it's a random vector using from a uniform distribution. And by default, ours uniform distribution will be a continuous between zero and one. Uh, we have actually set that, and we'll learn about this more in a, in a future tutorial, but this is setting, setting the min and max values, and we're asking to produce 10 random numbers that are from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So we should, of course, see what x looks like. Let's just clear the screen. x. Okay, as we see, we've got 10 numbers here between 0 and 1. Uh, so for instance, let's pretend that these this x, this vector of x, was actually vectors of p-values from a set of tests we want to do, and we want to be able to make some quick statement about them. Well, um, we, what we can do is feed that x <clears throat> into our our, um, our functions here. Well, the first one was p.test, so we can go p.test x. And then we get an error message. This condition has length greater than 1, and only the first element will be used. So the point here is that the if and the else if sort of breakdown like that is really designed after a scalar, which of course is kind of funny since R has no actual scalar. Um, but the idea is that there's a single number, so it's a vector of length 1 is, what, is what's the only acceptable input for that. So if we just had p.test 0, it'll give us, it, it'll, it'll pass 1, it'll pass, and of course we do it somewhere in between, it will do it. The other one, p.test.2, which we use the, the if-else function, 
This one is designed for vectorized input. And so what you actually do is get for each element of your vector a specific statement. And so that's really good. It's much faster. It's, it's really often the way to go. There may be other cases where you want to use if else it really depends, but, but often for numeric uh, work in R, that's what we are going to use. Okay, so let's think about that same sort of thing. So we're doing some sort of simulation for a power analysis. Uh, power is a term that some of you may not know, but power is the way that we, and we'll, we'll learn this in class, but is something that we're going to think about in terms of how, how really powerful are our tests to do based on our data or on, on what our expectations of what our data would, might look like and, and the type of test. Um, you can certainly look this up in Gotelli and, uh, and Ellison but we'll get to it in, in a later class. In this case, essentially we're generating a ran for, we're going to just generate a thousand random uh, numbers from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, which of course is also the boundaries we'd have for a p-value, has to be uh, between 0 and 1. And we can do that. And we can use this for something very simple, like saying, well, we want to know of all the p-values we've computed, how often are they less than 0.05? Um, as a nominal idea of a, a cutoff. Again, we'll, we'll come back to that later. If the p-value is 0.05 or less, what we're asking it to do is output 1. Any other value, so if it's, if it's greater than 0.05, it'll give us a 0. So we can run this, and then we can actually look at p.ifelse, and this should be, you should before you run this, think about what this should be a vector of, so it would be a good place to pause it. Okay, I'll assume you've unpaused, and then we can run it. And not surprisingly, we get a huge vectors of zeros and ones. Ones for every uh, instance, for every element which has a value less than 0.05, and any value that is greater than 0.05 has a zero. And so we could, and there's obviously much simpler ways to do this, uh, and you'll see that below, but we could basically sum up how many instances we got of 1, so just using the sum function, and divide that by the length of, of the number of p-values we started with, and that gives us our nominal uh, cutoff. So how many, uh, you know, how many, what proportion of cases do we have p-values that are less than 0.05 uh, from the 1,000 simulations? Well, about 5% of the, 5.5% of the time in this particular case, which shouldn't come as a great surprise since there's a random uniform distribution between 0 and 1. That should make some sense and, and uh, We'll come back to that a little bit later in class two. Uh, in this particular case, it would be much smarter to use, as I always mentioned to you in class, inde the index of R is incredibly powerful. This is a, a great place to do it. Um, using that, you say, okay, of that original vector of p.1000, how many elements of that p.1000 are less than or equal to 0.05, and then divide that by length of p.1000. Uh, uh, p That'll give you the same answer, and it turns out if you wanted to and use system time, you could see if you did this for a much larger um, set of p-values, you'd see that it's actually much faster to do it in this particular case. Um, okay, so one thing that would be worth trying here is to make sure you, you know what's doing is maybe try rewriting, say, this if-else function to have these additional conditions that you have here, where we have if, else, if, else. Here we essentially just have a, if it's less than 0.05, do this else do that, well, how do you integrate the additional else? And I'll let you guys try that, and that might be a, a worthwhile exercise to do. Okay, so the next piece that we'll spend the next sort of six or seven minutes with is really using some simple loops. And I'm actually going to skip the while loop, but you can take a look at it. That's line sort of 38 to 43 if you want to play with it, because we're going to really focus on using the for loop um, in class. And <coughs> the for loop functions uh, very much like for loops do in, in most. So what we're really asking for here is, okay, we're going to say for, uh, and this is, you can consider this your uh, index for, for the, the loop, is you're basically saying for each iteration or uh, index in 1 to 10. So this is basically saying going from, for i in 1 to 10, so from going from 1 through to 10, print values i. So hopefully you will know from, from previous uh, experience what this will do. If you don't, well, not surprisingly, you're going to get an output of 1 through 10. Now, notice here in the R console, you may do something that you were, well, depending on, on if you see what's going on, you may or not have expected this. The index next to each element here is 1, because it's, we're not making one big vector. It's not the same as if we just went 1 colon 10. 
where it would be a single vector. Here, it's outputting it one at a time. So each time it outputs it, it's, the output is a vector of length 1 as opposed to a single vector of length 10. Okay? <coughs> you can also use the for loop. Uh, you don't need to use integers for this. You can, you can say, okay, for i and say some sequence from 1 to 5 by 0.05. That's completely legit. And so here again, think about what you should output before you try it. See if you're correct. And hopefully you will understand that essentially what happens here is you get 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5. So it's the same idea. i doesn't need to be an integer. It can be uh, of any kind of value. And you can use this for elements in lists, uh, rows, columns, whatever. If, if you set it up for, you can also use it for the behavior of strings. And again, remember, strings are called characters in R. Um, they tend to be a little bit more involved, and so sometimes it does things that are different. This is one of these instances where it's good to know how it's different from Python for those of you who, who uh, took Titus's course and, and really your only previous experience is with, is with Python. So if we do this for letter in Word, print letter, you might be saying, okay, well, what I expect here is that it'll print out each letter as an element. But that's not how R is going to treat Word. Word is going to be treated as a single uh, object. It doesn't know that you want W-O-R-D. And so if you do that, all it prints out for you is Word because it's of length one. So if you actually, um, let's call, uh, we'll make an object and we'll call it Word. And we can ask what the length of Word is it's one, what you're probably wanting is the number of characters of word, and to do that you actually have to use the nCare function. So one way of doing it is to use uh, one of the many functions. R has actually a pretty useful set of, of uh, functions for, for string manipulation, um, uh, although you often don't hear about them in, in these lectures. If people are interested, just come and ask me. I've got several tutorials written on that, but they're not germane to this course. Um, but the string split, str split function, does exactly what you expect. It splits on some arbitrary character. In this case, if you split on blank, it's basically assuming that you want to split on, on uh, nothing. So it'll split between each letter in this particular case. So we do that, and in fact, it strings, uh, string splits word into w-o-r-d. Um, so this might be one way, and there's other ways that you could consider doing this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You could go for letter in str split word, and then just exactly what we did before, it's going to split it up and print the letter. So what it'll do is basically take word, split it up, and then print each letter at a time. And this will give you your w-o-r-d, as you might want to see it. Um, and of course we can do it. str split would be uh, an easier way of doing it, but, but that would just give you an exact idea. Okay, now again, this may lead people to a certain way of thinking about how to do, um, say, outputting of random numbers or uh, doing simulations in, in many sort of more traditional, I shouldn't say older, but traditional programming languages, say, such as uh, C-style, Algol-style languages. You know, so you might say, well, what I really want to do is I want to generate a thousand random numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And so basically what you'll do is you'll generate one random number at a time, that's what that n equals one says, with a mean equals zero and a standard deviation of one. And we just run this for loop and blow through it and we should get a thousand random numbers here. We didn't save it as an object, but that's okay for the moment. And again, you sort of, if you notice the index, each time we're printing out a single uh, vector of length one. And if we wanted to put all of these in a vector, um, well, what we would do, and this is, there's other ways of doing it, but this is the smartest way, is we initialize a vector first to store all the numbers. Um, I guess I don't need to, I already, I asked that question, but um, here. So here we're going to look, we're going to generate a vector of length uh, 100,000. Uh, we'll, uh, so we, we're specifying first n, uh, we'll use that for, for length. Uh, and we're going to create this empty vector which we're just repeating na, just no, no information, no data, uh, 100,000 times, or n times. Okay, so that just creates an empty vector of 100, 000, length 100,000. Um, and there's other ways of doing it. You, here's another example of doing it. 
uh, just by going x is numeric of length n, that will also do it, but that puts zeros instead of na's. So if you're worried, if zero may have some actual meaning or be put out, you may want to be careful of that. So if we run this loop, like this, you'll see it actually doesn't take that long, but it takes maybe a second or so. Uh, and we could output x, and it's going to be ridiculously long. It's 100,000 elements long. Um, we don't really need to see it. Um, turns out in R, that's actually pretty computationally inefficient. So we'll use the system.time time function to see that. So all I've done is wrap the function we wrote above in the system.time function. And we actually see it. It takes total time of about 0.7 seconds, 0.717 seconds. Um, we can also use a function that we'll learn about uh, in the next tutorial, the replicate function, which is one way of doing this. Um, so I won't go through the syntax now, I'll just show it to you. Um, but this will do the same thing, and this is going to be slightly faster, so in this case 0.6 odd seconds, about 20% fa faster, and that seems to be true really on, regardless of the computer I've, I've tried it on. But the thing I want you to keep in mind is R is vectorized. It's designed to do these kind of vector operations. So in fact, what is much faster to do is instead of try to generate 100,000 vectors of length 1 and stitch them together or put them all into this um, uh, X that we created before, let's create a new one, we'll call it Y, but we're doing the same thing. And we're just saying, hey, all at once we want you to create a vector of 100,000 along coming from this normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So we just put N here, uh, which is just how many uh, random normal variables we want to create um, with a mean 0 standard deviation of 1. And if you can see down here, it might be a little bit small on your screen. Again, at least in uh, Max, it'll, it'll actually give you the, the basic arguments for this function. And if we do this, it's really fast. So it's, it's 65, 70 uh, times faster than, than the for loop. Um, so the general rule in R is that loops are generally slower than the apply family of functions, at least for small to medium data sets. Um, I'll talk more about where, where that breaks down uh, in the next tutorial. But these are both going to be much, much slower than, than vectorized computation. So that's something to always keep in mind. All right, try it yourself, and then I'll see you at the next tutorial.